me. I am Nancy Brown and the Vice Chair of the Board of Directors and have been the Acting Chair uh, for a period of time. And one of the things that I want to start off announcing is that we actually will have a chair with us the next time we get together. And it is going to be Admiral uh, Jim Stavridis. And I'm sure that you all are You're all very well aware of uh, the Admiral's bio, uh, his support and continuing contributions to the Institute. Uh, we can't say enough good things about him, and we're very excited to have him join us as an appointed member of the board and uh, to serve as the chair. Uh, so um, you'll see a, an, announce, an official announcement this afternoon with a press release, and uh, it will be effective upon his retirement from uh, active duty. So we'll see him up here next year at this time, and I'll be sitting down there where I belong. Um, I also want to recognize uh, the board of directors today. Uh, I think just about all of them are with us, and if you guys, and they all are guys, could stand up. Um, we have, we're Admiral Dan Bowler, Dr. Jack London, uh, Captain Gordon Van Hook, Captain Carl Hasslinger, Lieutenant General Chip Drexen, we have Master Chief uh, Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Ben Patton, who keeps us all straight. <laughs> we have Ed Miller, who was a former member of the board, and we're pleased to have you with us today. We have a brand new member, Vice Admiral Dirk Devine. Devine? I'm still working on that one. We have our CEO, Pete Daly, and Duncan Smith, who is uh, represented counsel for the board for several years, and we're saying goodbye to him today, and I appreciate his service very much. And we also have uh, Donald Brennan, who was a former board member with us today, and Donald, we're very pleased to have you with us. So, we have, our, we have our active duty guys, which are not sitting in the right place. <laughs> Captain McFarland, and we have a brand new Coast Guard, our uh, Marine Corps liaison, um, Bob Major General Bob Walton. 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 Okay, thank you all very much. So the board works very hard um, for the membership. We're all about the members. And uh, I'm really pleased to have Pete uh, come up and to give you a report on the Institute and the great things that the staff has been doing and the direction that we're going I think is absolutely the right direction. Everything's looking good for the Institute and we enjoy the uh, support of all of our members and are just thrilled to be able to share uh, the update with you today. So keep... Thank you. Ask everybody to stand up and do a pledge of allegiance before we start the business of the Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Well, this first slide here is really just to remind us that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, April 11, 1878, the meeting was called to order at 8 p.m. by Commander A.T. Mahan, who then led the uh, meeting of the annual, the, not the annual meeting, but a regular meeting of the Naval Institute. And uh, I think it's worth just remembering um, who we follow and how important this organization is as we uh, as we move forward. 
Uh, a couple other things that are important to keep in mind here is uh, that as members of the Institute, uh, we have an important charge to keep it going and sustain our mission. I'd also like to thank our sponsors today, uh, USAA. Uh, we're joined here by Vice Admiral Retired John Bird, Nathan Kinley, and Mark Hildebrand. We thank USAA uh, for the partnership that we have with them and specifically for um, sponsoring our annual meeting. Um, thank you. Today also we're going to announce election results. We're going to talk about how the Institute is faring. We're going to hear from Sandra Grimes about her terrific book, Circle of Treason, about the Alder James case. And after that, we'll, uh, and we're going to have our honors and recognize our 2012 award-winning authors. And after that, we're going to walk across the street. And I hope many of you can stay for that and uh, congratulate our um, award winners and uh, mingle as members uh, over at the Postal Museum. Uh, we're going to allow time at the end for questions and answers. And I'd ask that people hold off till then. If you have a burning question, you need to jump out of your chair. Please do. And uh, and we'll we'll keep out. Next slide. So here's the election results, and uh, the Constitution and Bylaws Initiative uh, passed uh, by over 97 percent. So that meets the two-thirds of those who vote requirement. And so the revised Constitution and Bylaws are now in effect from this moment, this this meeting forward. Um, I, I thought it was important to, to mention all the board of directors here. We elected nine, but we also have um, the people, we have additional people like Claude Barabee, ex officio, chairman of the Ed Board, who's also Ed Board and Board. Uh, myself, is on, I'm on their ex officio, but most importantly, we have our other advisors. Uh, Nancy mentioned uh, Bob Walsh, but Rear Admiral Kerry Thomas and Rear Admiral Bill Moran our other active duty advisors, and uh, I just thank them all for their support. It's a completely voluntary, uh, it's a completely voluntary uh, time of service for them. They don't get a dime, and they put a lot of work in. And I would also like to ask our editorial board members who are here today, could you stand up? We have any of our, obviously Claude's here, BJ's here. Uh, we have two members of our editorial board, but the whole group, uh, all nine that were on the ballot were elected. We had a couple appointed, but you can see they too are completely voluntary, and I think we should give our Ed Board. Uh, so that's uh, election results, and I think uh, I think that the the only other thing that's uh, worth mentioning there is that. Uh, we have a couple members of our Ed Board that are departing. Nancy mentioned several people on the board who are departing. But I'd like to thank Lieutenant Commander Tom Darcy, U.S. Coast Guard, Lieutenant Robert McFall, and Lieutenant Jack Walsh, who are departing the Ed Board. And we gave a complete uh, year of service. Let's give everybody a hand. Uh, Nancy, Nancy has mentioned that Admiral Stavridis, upon his retirement, will accept and become, accept appointment to the board and become our board chair. I think, you know, this is not meant to be an eye chart that you read, but it's interesting <laughs> that over, that uh, Jim Stavridis is the author of over 40 articles or comment and discussion pieces in proceedings uh, from the time he was a midshipman up to the present. <coughs> He's also author. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. He's also authored or co-authored four Naval Institute press books, and that's him and his wife uh, Laura, who's also one of our authors. And uh, we just couldn't be more excited about that. So we think uh, effective in. And if I had to guess, midsummer, our next meeting in July, he will be our board chair. Uh, next slide. Okay, 2012. 2012. Uh, the board authorized us to make 2012 an investment year, actually to go in the hole a little bit and to work on initiatives and give more energy uh, to some of our uh, initiatives at the Institute. And I'm happy to say I just picked off what I think are the big ones here, but the website redesign, the USNI News hiring the editor and the news rollout, smartphone, tablet app, membership marketing, 
improved renewal experience, focused on conference content, and focused on periodical submissions and acquisition. Um, these were huge. So in 2012, I, I think the staff of the Institute, without a lot of extra added resources, read no added resources, uh, pulled off a significant accomplishment and really moved the content of the Institute forward. As far as the, uh, the financials, we did better than the previous year, but we still uh, lost on the bottom line for the Institute approximately 1.6 million, and the lion's share of that was due to uh, obligations that we have to meet to declare for our, uh, our pension obligation. I think many of you are businessmen, and you know that as interest rates go down, you don't have to pay all that money in one year, but you have to show it as an obligation as you move forward. So uh, that's what that is. And uh, I think uh, as far as other things to mention, as far as the bottom line of the Institute uh, as we move ahead, is simply this, that <clears throat> we think we've got the content and the direction of the Institute right as far as the initiatives go. But 2013 should be the year that we go from red to black in terms of you know, sustaining as we move forward the work of the Institute. We'll talk some more about that. Thank you. Next. Uh, last year, we talked a lot about the strategic plan. And the key pieces of the strategic plan were listed on this chart. And I'm happy to report that the strategic and professional content has moved forward. We do have quicker, faster speed on our content. We have increased the membership. We have better electronic access. And we have improved our connections to the active duty and others. Uh, on this front, we're moving forward on digitizing the important work of preserving the archives of the Institute. This work is not moving as fast as I'd like because it's really foundation dependent. And, uh, but we do have uh, volunteers and we have a level of effort that's moving this forward year on year. We just want to speed that up. And I'll come back to the volunteers a little bit more, um, a little bit more later. But the important thing to know is that we talked about a lot of things last year and things that we wanted to get accomplished in the strategic plan. And uh, we've made, in my view, uh, significant progress. Next slide. Okay, the first thing on the web to consider is that, you know, we're a very diverse organization. Even though we're small, there's a lot of moving pieces. And this web redesign was carried out to make the member experience better and to make, to make the online initiatives support several of these other things that we want to get done in the future. For instance, if you want to order books, if you want to join, if you want to do almost anything, it takes you to the web. One of the significant changes that we have made is that members are now able to see their information online and updated online. And if you haven't done that, I ask you to do that because it helps us understand who we are and serve you better. But we've also, in the website redesign, we've incorporated better search capabilities, solar search for those who are interested, and also different commentary and comment discussion software called Discuss. And uh, if you haven't been on the website lately and searched, if you, if you pull up your favorite author, if you go in there and, and, and want to search by topic, it's a much better functionality, much better search capability, and much better um, navigation capability on the website. So I ask you to do that. Uh, pictured here is our wiki, which is improving uh, month by month. We have more and more people involved in the wiki. And, uh, but the bottom line here is just to know that as we move forward, we see the web and having the knowledge base to shape the web as the internal core competency of the Institute extremely, as an extremely important thing. There's a real tendency to outsource all this and just go buy it by the pound. But then we found that you're not able to shape your future as well as you like unless you have a certain core competency and understanding of the tech piece. So the web piece was a huge, uh, was a huge thing for us to get done this year. Next. Okay. As far as the apps, as far as the apps go, I think it's very, it's very useful to see. You know, here you can see, you know, iPod, you know iPhone, iPad, and then the Android products. The, the thing here with the app was that 
we wanted to make this experience one that was optimized towards our active duty, our active duty audience. Uh, we worked very hard to get the app out. It cost us a few months to do it the way we wanted to do it. But for instance, we built in a feature where you can download into your device. And Apple said to us, well, why would you want to do that? And we said, because we want to take it into the device because we have disadvantaged users. And they said, well, everybody has 3G, 4G. And we said, not, not everybody. <laughs> and and uh, you know, the Navy's talked about uh, you know, providing 3G, 4G at sea. And you know, I'll believe it when I see it. But in the meantime, um, we need to have we need to have that kind of functionality. It's also this um, app technology sets us up for um, you know a transformation in how we deliver to certain customers. For instance, our international customers were paying over a hundred dollars a year to get a printed copy of our magazine sent to them months late, and the quality of that experience was declining as uh, time went on. And now with the app, it's right there, you know, it's right there right away. And we also think that set, we think this sets us up for other things um, in the marketplace as we move forward, like electronic delivery and more online member, uh, memberships that make more sense now that you can put it in your hands. Um, we need to do this because increasingly, this is where our members are. We had to go here. Because many of you, it's not just young members, it's all members. Um, I, I'm not going to do a show of hands, but the tablet thing has moved much faster than people predicted, and the penetration of that is hugely, is hugely important to us, because as you might appreciate, <clears throat> in the publishing business, we are right on the cusp of people making the jump between print and electronic and we're watching that very closely as we move forward. All publishers are, it's nothing to do with the Naval Institute per se, or the military per se, but the whole publishing business is undergoing a transformation. And so we're sitting here with part print, part E, and we have to set ourselves up for that future group. And this is a huge step for us as we uh, introduce the app. Next slide. So now, We'll talk about USNI News for a minute. You know, uh, we talked last year about the need to fill in something between the print magazine and what we were doing on the blog. We had some real-time stuff on the blog and still do, and I consider the blog important. But we also felt like there was some fast movers that we weren't covering uh, well enough and fast enough. So the USNI News does that. And uh, if you haven't been on that site, I encourage you to do that. Uh, so please subscribe. We have a push capability. You can see it show up on your desktop every day. Read it, don't read it. But I think it's a great, it's, a, it's filling a niche for us that we needed to fill. Um, the growth of this has been fantastic. Of course, this time last year, we were at zero. And it's only been just over 60 days since we did the hard rollout of this site. I got a couple numbers here that I think are worth, uh, you know, worth anchoring on for a minute. USNI News has had 441,000 unique views since 7 February, and including two <coughs> drudge hits that we had, uh, which are very important to us to get referenced and linked to the drudge report. Um, we, if you count those, we've had 7,300 hits a day. So it's a significant growth. And when you consider that we just started up, I think this is hugely, it's hugely important. It's not just faster, it's addressing a different type of content. We also want to be the place, I mean, I think that those of you who served in the Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, you always remember that there was somebody in the service who always had the, had the information that you needed. You could be in the middle of the Indian Ocean, but you need to read something and you might have to call this guy or gal in Norfolk because you know they were the person that had everything. And uh, we are trying to be at least a site where people can go and reliably, if something's been posted, if there's a report that's out, if there's a memo that's out, if there's a slide that's you know kicking around, we want to be a place where reliably 
active duty members and others can go and uh, get that information. Um, again, the presence is uh, the presence is ramping up. It's a strong presence, and it's important to consider that it's not just military centric; it's medium centric. And uh, one of the features of this is that we have uh, a design feature in this where no matter how you turn your device, no matter what size you're displaying it on, it'll reconfigure the layout for you and make it user friendly. And what's, it, what's the exact need for that, Mary? Responsive design. Responsive design. And uh, we're, getting good, we're getting good reports from the users on that. So uh, a huge growth, a huge growth in this medium. If things are working white, right, the combination of the web, the app, and USNI News will make the Naval Institute more ready, more professional, to serve not just the professionals, but the whole profession. And uh, we think we're on our way. Ebooks. With respect to ebooks, and now we're segueing into the press, but when you consider <coughs> that in 2010 we had a handful, 2011 we were at 52 titles. This is where we are in 2012, 119, to date 150 and 13. And by the end of this year, we'll be up to 270 ebooks. And the ebook thing is, uh, is huge for us because it takes advantage of the tablets, which is a growing market. And right now, we're bringing in about $30,000 a month which for us is huge, $30,000 a month in revenue on ebooks. And uh, this is an important market for us. And uh, again, you can see that we're there with Apple, Amazon, Google, Barnes and & Noble, and we're in all those readers. And uh, <clears throat> Seal of Honor, pictured here, is a great example because uh, right now we're just at the cusp where the ebook sales for Seal of Honor now exceed what we did in uh, paperback. And our soon, we think, will exceed what we did in hardcover. And so we've sold over 60,000 Seal of Honor. And uh, we think that the, the e-book stream is the one that will keep on giving. It will be the gift that keeps on giving. And it's so important to us. Also, this technology <coughs> offers us other ways to participate in the electronic marketplace. Next slide. Okay, now this is a good one. This is a print on demand. Now, there's a few there's a few titles here that people in this room may remember when they first came out. And uh, you know, one of the core one of the core strengths of the institute is that we own our content. Since 1899, when the press opened up, we own about a thousand titles. But a lot of those titles come out of print, and people can't get access to them. And uh, you know, we've tried to be responsive. We had a lieutenant, Robin Fall, who, based on a discussion on Sailor Bob, said, "Hey, we need to bring back, you know, Paul Rin's book, uh, No Higher Honor," and we, you know, we got that book back. But we had to print it. Uh, we had an admiral, John Richardson, who said, that, bring back rules of the game. We did. We brought it back. We got the rights. We printed it. But with print on demand, where we'll be able to go, and we hope to get here before year end, you'll be able to order a book, any book, that's on our print on demand list. And if we have to print one, we can print it at a profit. So we go right to a, they go right to a printer. They print it out. They fulfill that book and send it to you. So you can get, if, if it's on our list for print on demand, we've already done the conversion, you'd be able to get that book uh, in less than two weeks. So the whole idea of out of print changes under this concept. And, uh, and it's an important one for us because we think, again, one of our biggest strengths is that unlike many publishers total, specifically publishers our size, we kept the rights. If we've got the paperback rights to the book, then we have the rights to do the paperback, print on demand, and the ebooks and the rest. And this is the future. And so we're very excited about this because it's such an important part of our mission 
to preserve history and continue to make it work. <coughs> Next slide. Okay. So let's talk about heritage for a minute. You may not be able to see it, but this is a this is a note that's uh, in that same journal that I showed at the beginning uh, for a different date. But this is from this is from November 19, 1897, and it's, uh, it just notes that tonight uh, Theodore Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, spoke to the Institute. Um, here's a copy of Volume One, Number One. But when you look at our heritage. Uh, section of the Institute. You consider that we have this huge archive of photos, and we have the most photos that have Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, of any other group outside the services themselves. And then we have a terrific amount of uh, material with uh, the proceedings and the other uh, historical documents that we own. I mean, people send us stuff all the time. And it's remarkable, really, because of uh, we had a lady in Tennessee uh, contact us recently and said, well, um, you know, my uncle was a photographer on the USS Indianapolis. And uh, he was the photographer. And uh, he died when the ship was sunk. But he was sending off his photographs um, every couple of days through the ship's post office. And he was bypassing the censors because he would do two of everything. He'd give one to the censor, and he'd send one home for the box. And then when he died, um, his family said to this four-year-old girl, said, guard this box, keep track of this box, and keep these pictures safe. And then now she's older, and she said, who do I give these pictures to? And she said, I'll give them to the U.S. Naval Institute. And they're fantastic pictures that show not just the life on the Indianapolis, but also they use the, they take photographers off the ships and they send them to places like Tarawa, Guam, Saipan, and he has uh, a tremendous collection of uncensored uh, photographs. It's really remarkable, including one of the atomic bomb, which I don't think is uh, going to be classified. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is. Uh, People send us these collections. They're important, and uh, and we need to preserve them. There's a huge trust here of people sending you that material, and then the need for us to preserve it, catalog it, archive it, and then finally make it available uh, for future generations, current and future generations. So it's a huge thing. And now a key part of uh, in this, and I, I think I mentioned this at the outset, but a key part of making this happen is that we have several volunteers. And these volunteers uh, work tirelessly uh, for the Institute for no pay. And currently we have four volunteers who have been um, working on all these archiving, cataloging projects we talked about, Mary Acosta, Joan Handelman, John Sherwood, and especially I'd like to mention um, Sandy Schlosser. And uh, before Sandy comes up, because I want to recognize her in front of the group, uh, these volunteers work about 700 hours a year cataloging, preserving, maintaining uh, art inventories, performing research, assisting with requests, and we get requests every day. And unlike a lot of organizations, we actually help the person who calls and asks for the photo that they remember from 30 years ago that they want now. And these volunteers also spent another 700 hours a year, give or take, on scanning photographs to meet gaps in our collection. And they go to the National Archives facility at College Park, and they fill, they fill them in. So one of the projects we, we just uh, completed was a, a collection to get all the photos from Edward Steichen uh, from World War II. Many people think of Edward Steichen as more of an anthropology-focused guy, but during World War II, he was a U.S. Navy-focused guy, and his photograph, his photograph collection is truly impressive, and now we have a complete um, collection. So I'd like to ask Sandy, who has been doing this volunteer work for 25 years, to come up and be recognized. Sandy. <laughs> So 
we, we thought about what do we give Sandy, and uh, you know, we thought about lots of things that are kind of, you know, like membership related and Naval Institute related, and finally somebody said, what Sandy likes the most is flowers from gardening. But Sandy, this doesn't even come close to uh, recognizing you, but we couldn't do it without you, and uh, we just want to thank you for your selfless dedication of time and hard work on behalf of the Institute. Thank you. understanding of the contribution of American sea power throughout the nation and throughout the globe. And you can see two articles here. Uh, this is Admiral Greenard's article from July of 12, which is the famous payloads over platforms article. And that got a lot of legs. I think Admiral Greenard said, Pete, that puppy got legs. <laughs> and, uh, and if I've told you this story, forgive me, but I, I talked to Admiral Greenard one day, and his son, his son was a former uh, service warfare officer. He's now out of the Navy. He's in the reserve. Dirk's reminded me that he affiliated with the Navy Reserve. <laughs> Good. But, uh, you know, he said, you know, my son's not always so impressed with the Admiral thing or the CNO thing. But he called me one day, Pete, and said, Dad, your article's in The Economist. <laughs> and he, said, he said his notch went up, you know, two notches. But, you know, we talked about this earlier, but if you have the senior article, but then you also have Print Me a Cruiser by uh, you know, Lieutenant Scott J.D. Peters and uh, Lieutenant J.G. Matt Hipple. And Hipple's a force. If you don't know Hipple, he's everywhere. It's like Hipple is everywhere. But uh, these guys wrote a thing on 3D printing that made it to Wired, Popular Science, and both articles had excellent uh, overseas coverage. And uh, you know, people say, well, how is it that you had, you know, 430 million impressions for the Naval Institute in the last 60 days? 430 million separate impressions. It's articles like this, and the aftershock of articles like this. But again, if it's working right, you've got that more strategic level discussion, and then you've got what I would call the 
advance the profession discussion, and what's priceless, as the commercial says, is when they, they get together. And uh, so we're very excited that uh, we're getting the senior participation and the junior participation both. And when it's all working, uh, there's an interaction there that is uh, just terrific. Next one. Okay, so membership. Last year, again, talking about the strategic plan, we said that the issue of membership is core to getting the Institute from survive to thrive. That we weren't going to make it unless we could grow and, uh, and start to build back our membership. And in April 2012, we were at 44,294, and today we're at 47,736. And in this environment, <laughs> we have engaged our members. Here's Hipple, I told you he's everywhere. And uh, here's Hipple talking to Paul Merslack at our member event at East. But I'll tell you, one of the key ones here has been the uh, ROTC thing. I have a separate slide on it, but this picture, uh, you know, I'm verklempt over this picture because we went from not being able to talk to Naval Academy Midshipmen about the Institute to having three companies in Mahan Hall, in Han Hall in January, January 9th, I believe it was, but maybe earlier. But three companies, and uh, each one, the way this is organized, because of personal privacy information and those requirements, each midshipman individually has to accept the gift. And we had companies that were 142 out of 142, 138 out of 142. So the result here has been fantastic. And uh, and it's uh, and it's growing all the time. Next slide will kind of tell a bigger story here. So if you look at this slide, this program uh, currently we have these ROTC schools, you know, South Carolina, Texas, Illinois, Wisconsin, Marquette, Holy Cross, SUNY Maritime, and Villanova. And several of the sponsors are in the audience today. We also have, for the Naval Academy, 6th Company, 15th, 17th, 27th, and 30th. So I'd like to just recognize for a minute that we have in our audience today, if I'm counting correctly, several of our sponsors. We got Dan Bowler, who did the 30th Company, uh, 27th Com Company, by several John Burr, 17th Company, Miss Mary Ripley, who did this in honor of her father, Colonel John Ripley, uh, 15th Company, uh, Jack London, 6th Company, uh, Vice Admiral James Sagerholm. And also for SUNY Maritime, we have Mr. Donald Brennan here today, who sponsored SUNY. And uh, I'm trying to think if I've seen anybody else on this list. This one, yes, this one was added yesterday, Bobby Inman, uh, sent us, he's a University of Texas kind of guy, sent us a check for Texas, Texas Austin. So uh, we think this is essential because one of the problems we had in the past was we weren't visible. And we talked about this last year, so I won't repeat that whole discussion. But suffice to say that in the last 10 to 15 years, we didn't have that automatic exposure to the uh, membership of the Navy Institute. That just wasn't there. And as time went on, uh, with lawyers and non-federal entities and personal information uh, protection requirements, uh, our chances of having that conversation went to zero until we turned it over and said, here's a gift, accept the gift, don't accept the gift, and uh, it's working It's working beautifully. Next slide. So here, I just want to talk briefly, a couple slides on conferences. Uh, first, you know, we said at the beginning that focusing on conference content and improving that conference content was one of our key areas for 2012. I think we accomplished that. Um, we had the chairman at East last summer. Um, this is the JO panel from East, uh, chaired by Tim Bokiti uh, last summer at East Virginia Beach. That was a terrific panel, by the way. At West, we had uh, Vice Chairman Sandy Winnefeld, Winnefeld, who did a superb job. I mean, it was really good. And uh, we got all three Sea Service Chiefs at West. It's the first time all three Sea Service Chiefs have gotten together under the aegis of the Naval Institute. They, you know, you can get them together on the East Coast. Occasionally, you can catch them together at Navy League, or maybe every other year, depending if there's a maritime strategy, you might catch them at 
uh, International Sea Power Symposium in Newport. But to get them to appear with us together and have an hour-plus discussion about the strategy and what the ways, means, and ends add up to meet that strategy, that was terrific. But even with all that, maybe the star was Captain Jim Fennell. Because Captain Jim Fennell uh, appeared on the China panel, and he said what everybody was thinking about China. But he said, and the aftershocks are still occurring. The joke we had in the office the next day is that perhaps he's in a witness protection program in Phoenix. <laughs> but <laughs> this guy was a rock star. And uh, I think he moved entire countries in the Pacific to have a discussion that they weren't having before about the true meaning of the, uh, of the actions that are being, take, being taken by China and specifically the PLAN. And he really, he really hit the ball far. And uh, that was terrific. Next one. Okay, we also decided, it was recommended to me, you know, my first six months, I talked to a lot of people, and you know how it works, it's just like when you're on active duty. For the, few, for the first few months, people actually tell you the truth. And then after that, you become part of the problem. But in the first few months, I got a lot of feedback that there was a need to have at least one of our conferences be uh, sponsored by us down in Washington and focus it on, um, and focus it on a, uh, a topic that was a current hot topic. And in early December, we did the fiscal cliff and focused on that and sequester. A lot of people, a lot of show of hands said never going to happen. Well, fiscal cliff only happened for a few hours there on the morning of January 1st and 2nd, but uh, we're still here with sequester and there's still a question whether we're going to live with sequester for a much longer period. Um, the jury's still out, but it was a great discussion and we were very happy to have uh, de former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bill Lynn be the keynote speaker. We had a terrific panel. Uh, we had a terrific panel with uh, McGregor, Lehman, Avalis, and KT McFarland as the moderator. Um, great discussion. It was a compact conference, short, like half to three quarters of a day, and we want to do this more, and we need sponsors for this. Next one. Okay, let's talk about the so what. Another thing that I got, Doug Crowder was one of the people who mentioned this, there were several others. So you have a conference, but then what happens next? What happens with that? How do we, do we move the ball? Well, here's an example where I think we want to go in the future. Uh, first, we had the History Conference at the Naval Academy, and it was on the subject of cyber. And so um, at lunch, and we had a full floor at lunch, and 900 mids attending, and, then, and you can see a lot of these mids, they're sitting there eating, they've all got these pizza boxes in their, in their laps because it was during lunch, so it was like, how do we feed the mids? Box lunch, box pizza. So 900 minutes, and they all came to hear this gentleman here, Kevin Mitnick. And uh, you know, it's the first time I've ever introduced a convicted felon. But uh, Mitnick is a, you know, kind of a scoundrel, and uh, he's very proud of it. But he's a hacker of some uh, renown, and the mids loved it. So uh, how, do we, how do we have the aftershock? How do we have the so what of that? Well, we had a second class Coast Guard Reserve Petty Officer write this blog post on Mitnick. And uh, that generated um, a tweet that had 111,000 forwards to it. So that's impact. Also, we're doing a much better job of taking all our conference content, loading it up, and taking advantage of the fact that we have a YouTube channel. You know, as a nonprofit, we get a high bandwidth YouTube channel for the right price. And uh, we're using it extensively. And so if you were not able to go to East and West, which we have, uh, we're happy to have our co-sponsor of East and West, uh, the head of FCA, uh, Ken Schneider, with us today. If you weren't able to go to those, you could see within an hour or two after the presentation, something get posted up in a very real-time fashion. We're, um, we're debating how much real time we want to get because we, we would like people to go to the conference. But we also want as many people as possible to be able to hear heroes like Jim Finnell, who, you know, I'm now the top guy in his fan club. But uh, 
that's also available. So between the blog, the YouTube channel, the tweets, the social, other social media, um, and treatment in the magazine, <clears throat> treatment in the magazine, follow up with articles and discussion, uh, we think we're doing a better job. We can continue to progress on that.